If you compare a mosquito flying at 1000 km per hour with a train going at 100 km per hour, which of the two has more motion in it? The question might seem a little weird, but you heard me right. I am asking which of them has more motion in it. Well, the mosquito is traveling at a higher speed, but speed is just a part of the story. Speed tells you how fast the motion is, but it doesn't tell you how much the motion is. So how do we measure motion? Can we even do that? The answer is yes, but to do that, we need to first define motion. A good definition would be a body has motion if it can transfer that motion. So in simple terms, a body which can transfer more motion has more motion. If this 1000 km per hour super mosquito were to come and hit me, it may cause some physical damage but it would hardly transfer any motion to me. On the contrary, if this 100 km per hour train were to hit me, I would get blasted off. So clearly the train has a hell lot of more motion compared to the mosquito, even though it is 10 times slower. Why? I think you can guess the answer. Mass. So mass also plays a key role here. I will give you a simple analogy. May not be a perfect one, but it's good enough. Think of motion as how much money you have. If you have say 10 coins with you, then it doesn't mean you have 10 bucks, right? To calculate how much money you have, you need to multiply that number 10 with the denomination that the coins represent. In this example, 5 bucks. So the total money is 50 bucks. Now if someone else had just 3 coins with him, but each coin is a denomination of 50 bucks, then the total is 150. You see what I mean? The number of coins is like the speed. The more you have it, the more money you have. But it is not equal to the amount of money. The denomination is like mass. You got to multiply them to calculate the total motion an object has. The technical term for this quantity is movementum. It's actually momentum, but you get the idea behind the name. And when I said speed, I actually meant velocity. You need to take into account the direction as well. This makes momentum a vector quantity, giving it the units of kilograms meter per second. So why do we need to measure motion in the first place? Isn't mass and velocity enough? Why put them together and make momentum an extra concept? Well, again, think in terms of money. If you pay someone 100 bucks, you may have given 10 coins of 10 bucks each. But when he received it, maybe he receives it as 2 coins of 50 bucks. So when the money is transferred, the number of coins transferred need not be the same. In this example, 10 coins were paid, but only 2 coins were received. Yet the money transferred is the same. And that is all that matters to us. Similarly, when one particle bangs into another, the speed lost by one particle is not equal to the speed gained by the second particle. However, interestingly, it turns out that the momentum lost by the first particle is equal to the momentum gained by the second particle. Put it another way, suppose we have two guys, one with 100 bucks and another one with 50. Forget about the coins and the denominations and everything, the total money they have is 150 bucks. If now they started exchanging money among themselves, after a while, I will have no clue who lost how much money. However, I do know one thing. The total money they have must remain 150 bucks because they were exchanging money among themselves. This gives us a very important law. If we consider a bunch of people, in physics we like to call this as our system, exchanging money between themselves, then the total money that they have does not change. But important thing is they must only exchange money among themselves or within the system. So if another dude, for example, also starts interacting and exchanging money, then the total money of this system will change. Similarly, if we have a bunch of particles interacting with each other, colliding, exploding, sticking to each other, whatever they want to do, their total momentum will not change as long as there are no external forces acting on it. 
This is one of the most powerful principles of physics and it's called as the conservation of momentum. This principle helps you solve some irritating problems in just a couple of steps. Allow me to demonstrate. Here is Mashi weighing 65 kilograms, holding a 5 kilogram medicine ball in his hand somewhere in deep intergalactic space. So Mashi gets bored and decides to throw this ball, say with a speed of 10 meters per second. Now clearly I will get a recoil speed. I want to evaluate what that speed is going to be. Okay, ready? Let's go. First step, decide what your system is going to include. Clearly in this problem, Mashi and the medicine ball. Then choose one direction as your positive. I like right side. Calculate the total initial momentum. Since both of them are at rest, the initial momentum is zero. Next step, consider the situation after the ball has been thrown. The medicine ball gets a forward momentum of 5 times 10, which is a plus 50 kilogram meters per second. I don't know what my recoil speed is. And here's a tip. When you don't know the value of some vector quantity, like in this example, Mash's velocity, don't assume any direction to it. You will get the direction automatically in the final answer. So I'm just going to assume that the recoil velocity is Vm. So Mash's momentum would be 65 Vm. Now invoke the conservation of momentum. Mash's force on the ball was within the system and there are no external forces. There's a total final momentum must equal the total initial momentum. So equating and doing some algebra, we find out the recoil velocity to be approximately minus 0.77 meters per second. The minus sign is saying the velocity is backwards, which makes perfect sense. I want to end this episode with three questions. First, if this medicine ball traveling at 10 meters per second was caught by a stationary girl weighing 35 kilograms, what would be their combined speed after she has caught the ball? Second, a photon of light is a massless particle. However, careful study has shown us that this photon can transfer motion when it hits other small particles like electrons. So what do you think? Does a massless photon carry momentum? And lastly, why is momentum of an isolated system conserved in the first place? The answers will come in the future episodes. So if you haven't already, subscribe and stay tuned.